Hello students. In this video, I am going to talk about pre-romantic poetry or precursors of romantic revival, romantic non-fictional prose and the pre-Raphaelite poetry very briefly and in a very simple manner. So pre-romantic poetry it means something before the romantic poetry. The romantic age started in England from 1798. It was the year of the publication of a lyrical ballad by Wordsworth and Coleridge. But the romantic traits that could be seen in the romantic poets such as Wordsworth, Coleridge, Byron, Shelley or Keats could be traced back earlier in the writings of or in the poems of some other poets of the 18th century. The 18th century was basically an age of prose and reason. Alexander Pope was the chief poet. Um, it was the age of satires, of classical writings, of city-oriented writings, ballrooms, cafe house, etc. But in that age, uh, a break was evident from such poems or such writings when we noticed that a tendency to return to nature, to sentimentalism, to the lofty imagination, fervent emotion, and sharpen sensibility, subjectivity. Now, these themes were evident in some of the poems of James Thompson, William Cowper, William Blake, Robert Burns. They were known as the pre-romantic poets or the precursors of romantic revival. In fact, in 1726, a poem called The Winter was published of Thompson. And after that, in 1751, Thomas Gray's A Elegy Written in a Country Churchyard was published. So, between those two poems, in 25 years gap, there's not much romantic kind of poems were published, only 9 or 10 few poems. But it gave a symptom or it gave a hint that a new kind of poetry were on the rise. So as I said earlier, the cheap pre-romantic poets, the first of all I would like to mention James Thompson. His important poems are The Winter, The Seasons, the castle of indolence and next uh, William Cowper his uh, famous poem is The Castor and then uh, an important poem a, an elegy written in a country churchyard by Thomas Gray now it talks about the low class people the peasants of a village, they had potential, they had possibilities, but they could not find proper ambience or opportunity to explore, to showcase their talents. So the poem talks about them. And then the most important poet probably, the most unique kind of poet, William Blake. Now William Blake was a painter, 
an engraver and also a poet. Now he was a mystical poet. And why was he different than others? Because he was a uh, firm believer on the power of imagination. He was very much against reason of reasoning everything. And there was a famous painting of him of Isaac Newton. Newton was drawing something with his head bent down and Newton was unaware of his surroundings. So he was actually criticizing Newton that he is too much engrossed in his own scientific works and not aware of the social restlessness or inequalities that was happening around him. So his poems were songs of innocence, songs of experience, the marriage of heaven and hell, Jerusalem. And after that, Robert Barnes was also a, uh, an important poet. His uh, important poem is uh, The Jolly Beggars. So you need to remember these poems of pre-romantic poets. And after that, I am going to talk about the romantic non-fictional writers or the romantic essayists. Romantic period is famous for his poems, but there are novel writers like Jane Austen and then essayists. Now there are three chief essayists of romantic era. First is Charles Lamb. The second is William Hazlitt and the third one is Thomas De Quincey. Now Charles Lamb, he uh, was the classmate of Coleridge and was born in London. So while most of the poets are trying to escape the din and bustle of London city, Charles Lamb used to love the crowd and the city of London, the streets of London, the book uh, stores of London. Now, Charles Lamb's life was uh, pretty troublesome, but he had acquired the style of hiding those pathetic issues with his humorous approach. So, in his essays, we find a blend of humor and pathos. So at a very early age of 14, he was forced to abandon his studies and started working as a clerk in, a, in an East Indian company. Uh, then he changed various offices and he took the pen name of one of his colleagues, Elia. <coughs> so the name of his essays is the essays of Elia. Uh, there are very, uh, there are some fabulous essays uh, like Grim Children, Erevary, A Super Animated Man, South Sea House. Uh, you are going to read some of them in your next semester. So these essays are called uh, autobiographical sketches. They are autobiographical, there are autobiographical elements, but Charles Lamb uh, did not care for precise uh, presentation, precise details. Sometimes he used to mix fact and fiction. So they are called autobiographical uh, sketches. Charles Lamb was a lifelong bachelor. Uh, his elder sister had some mental uh, issues, psychiatric problems. She, in a fit of rage, stabbed her mother. So the co court uh, passed the judgment on uh, her and told Charles Lamb that you have to take care of her. So Charles Lamb did not marry. He used to take care of her elder sister and work relentlessly. So he put these pathetic issues in a 
a rapper of humor in his essays. So this was uh, very much, this technique was actually first used by Monte in French, then Kaule in English. So after Charles Lamb, it was William Hazlitt. William Hazlitt was uh, quite an opposite to Charles Lamb. He was very outspoken, very straightforward. Uh, at that time, England was in conflict with France and uh, France was ruled by Napoleon. But William Hazlitt supported some of the ideals of Napoleon. So he was criticized by the government, but Hazlitt did not move away from his opinion. His famous exercise is the spirit of the age in which he portrays uh, he portrayed, uh, some of his contemporaries and passed his opinions uh, without any hesitation. And after that, the last one is Thomas De Quincey. Thomas De Quincey was a person of various tastes. Uh, he was a literary critic. He also uh, used to uh, write down his own observations on various issues. So the best known uh, essays uh, of Thomas De Quincey is the uh, Confessions of an English Opium Eater. Now, in, at that time, uh, many men used to take opium uh, to relieve pain, to induce sleep, so Thomas De Quincey was also an opium addict and <clears throat> so in that book he wrote down his observations and then uh, there is a there uh, is a famous scene in Macbeth, water scene. Thomas De Quincey has an essay on that scene on the knocking on the gate in Macbeth. And some of his uh, historical essays are also famous, and Joan of Arc. So you need to remember uh, these things for romantic essays. And then come the pre-Raphaelite poetry. It was in the Victorian period. The pre-Raphaelite poetry. What is pre-Raphaelite poetry? Now pre means uh, before something. So, Raphael was an artist of Renaissance period, Elizabethan period, Renaissance period. Now, these uh, pre Raphaelite poets, they wanted to bring the qualities or the ideals that existed before uh, the artist Raphael came into, uh, or in other way, um, the artistic qualities or ideals of medieval period that is before renaissance uh, because they believed raphael as a as an artist corrupted the notion the purity of art so they wanted to bring back uh, fra anglicos bellini these kind of artists ideals the simplicity sincerity truthfulness of presentation. They were fed up with the scientific doctrines of the uh, industrialization material pursuit of the Victorian age. So uh, there are mainly three founders of Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. Uh, they are DJ Rossetti, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, John Everest Millais and William Holman Hunt. They founded this pre raphaelite Brotherhood in 1848 and they were they were paint painters. They were students of Royal Academy of Arts. So they used to paint and they also used to compose poems and their poetry their poems were published in a journal called the Germ, uh, G E R M, the Germ. So there are mainly four chief poets, pre Raphaelite poets. 
they were DJ, uh, DG Rossetti, uh, his sister Christiana Georgina Rossetti, William Morris, and A.C. Swinburne. So these are the four chief P. Raphaelite poets. Now, D.G. Rossetti's famous poems are The Blessed Damosel, The Ballad of Sister Helen, The King's Tragedy, The House of Life, a collection of 101 sonnets. So he brought back those medieval things, the Gothic settings, the simplicity, sincerity in his paintings as well as in his uh, poems. Then come his uh, sister, Christiana Georgina Rossetti. Her poems are the Goblin Market and Other Observations, A Pageant and Other Observations, Verses. Her poetry was more based on religion, religious themes, and her famous poem was Goblin Market, which uh, is in syllabus. So, it was a famous poem. Next is William Morris. William Morris' famous poem is The Defense of Guinevere and other poems. And A.C. Swinburne. A.C. Swinburne was a student of Oxford where he fell under the spell of those Pyrrhaphalite poets. And then he developed his own style and composed uh, some famous poems like Hymn to Proserpine, Atlantine Calendon, Tristram and other poems, Erythius, uh, Songs Before Sunrise, etc. So these are the famous pre uh, poems.